This morning, I want to talk about test our thoughts and our attitudes. I think we're living in a time when stereotypes and prejudices have been normalized. And our thoughts and our words are more important now than ever. In the hymn book, we have a hymn called Speak, O Lord. And this is a little bit of the text from that hymn. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. This morning, I would like for us to take a few moments to test our thoughts and our attitudes. Next slide, Paul. We have all said something that is based on a false assumption, or we've perpetuated a stereotype, or we've incorporated a prejudice into our thinking. And when we do this, we are painting an entire group of people with a broad brush and labeling them all as troublemakers or undesirables or simply unimportant. So let's do a little test of some of our thoughts by looking at eight statements. Next. This is one I've heard a lot since 9-11. There certainly are people in the world that want to harm us. But according to the internet, there are 1.8 billion, that's with a B, Muslims in the world. Do we know any Muslims? How can we say all 1.8 billion are terrorists? It's almost a silly statement to make. Statements like this allow us to demonize people we don't even know. I don't think this will stand up under the radiance of God's purity. Next. Ah, those people out in rural America are just uninformed rednecks. This is the classic prejudice between city people and country people. Phrases like those people serve to distance us from some group out there. And once we isolate ourselves from those people, the people we have isolated are at the mercy of our doubts and our fears. Next. Rich people are self-centered snobs. I've been hearing this. Isn't it interesting that rich people are always some group that is richer than we are? Certainly there are self-centered people, but I know some rich people that are not self-centered. They're very generous. Jay and Cherry Newcomb were the main donors behind the renovation and expansion of the student union at Graceland University. And I remember Cherry telling me that while she was growing up, her family lived in a tent for a while. She has never forgotten that. And she and Jay want to be a blessing to others. Next. Ooh, poor people are just lazy. Well, this is another really broad sweeping statement it implies that there's just one reason for being poor and it has nothing to do with us. And that makes it okay for us to ignore people. We just need to be careful with what we think and what we say, because a lot of times these statements are really off the mark. Next. Those people out on the West Coast are wacko. Oh my, another broad statement that lumps an entire region of the country into a group we want to ignore. I think there's wackiness everywhere. Why do we say things like this? Next. Oh, this is a serious one. Most violent crime is committed by Blacks and Hispanics. What a terrible thing to say. My banker is a Black woman. My family doctor is a Hispanic man. 
Their racial and ethnic heritage should not be hijacked as the explanation for violence in our country. On January 6th, the group of white people stormed the Capitol in Washington, DC. So people of color do not have a monopoly on violence. We need to be careful who we blame for our troubles. Next. Immigrants just come to the US so they can be on the dole. Well, the immigrants I know are hardworking and trying to survive and put down roots in a new country. That's what my family lines did back in the 1860s. For some reason, immigrants are not always welcome now. In Olathe, I shopped at Payless Foods. It was a grocery store with a warehouse atmosphere and good prices. And the immigrant community knew this, that they would get more for their money there. Sometimes I felt like I was shopping at the United Nations. I heard many languages spoken. I saw a woman in a full burqa one day. The store was aware of its international customers and they stocked things in the produce department that I didn't even know what they were or how to prepare. A few shoppers approached me for help reading labels, so I was able to give a few brief English lessons. It was a good experience. The day I remember best was a few days before Thanksgiving. I had stopped by on the way home from work, oh, and the store was packed, as you would expect. It was hard to tell who was in what line waiting to check out. And a man was checking out with his two children, one in the cart and then a little preschooler standing by him. And I guessed he was from Eastern Europe. He understood English, but he had to think really hard to formulate his reply in English. And while he was concentrating, his little girl got bored and she started wandering back into the crowded store. I noticed her and a Chinese grandmother standing near me noticed her and a Hispanic woman with her own two kids noticed her, and a tall black woman behind me, who I think was newly arrived from Africa, tapped me on the shoulder because she had noticed her. The little girl was fine, but she was wandering away. She was enjoying the labels and the displays, and finally dad realized she was gone, and he looked up, and about eight women in unison pointed to where she was. Now we didn't know one another, but we were a little community then. And I want more moments like that. Next, please. Those Indians act like they are our equals. Well, the Indians were here first. Why shouldn't they be? I grew up in Tulsa. And California, Arizona, and Oklahoma have the highest population of Native Americans in the United States. From my school days, I remember Charles Chibetty, he was Comanche, and Jay Echo Hawk, he was Pawnee and Bryce Wildcat, I think he was Sue, I'm not sure about that. I knew Charles the best. My maiden name was Chatburn, and when Charles was in my class and we were in alphabetical order, Charles Chibity was always behind me. He was one of the good guys, he really was. It wasn't until the 1990s that I learned that Charles' dad, Charles Sr., had been a code talker during the war. Now, most of you probably know that the Navajo were coke talkers in the Pacific theater, but in the European theater, they used Comanche. In an interview in the 1990s, Charles Sr. pointed out the irony of his life. He said, it's strange, but growing up as a child, I was forbidden to speak my native language at school. Later, my country asked me to speak Comanche. My language helped win the war. I hope the soldiers around him in his unit realized that Charles Chibetty Sr. was their equal. 
Unfortunately, the United States didn't acknowledge the contribution of the Comanche Code Talkers until 1999. And Charles Sr. was the only one left by that time. Next slide. What are our thoughts and words revealing about us? What are we teaching others when through suspicion or fear, we label people as wacko or violent or lazy or uppity? In the musical South Pacific, there is a song. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. Howard Thurman, a black minister and theologian said, Jesus rejected hatred, not because he lacked strength. He rejected hatred because he knew that hatred brings death to your spirit and death to your community. It's hard work to monitor and change our thinking. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. That's the first step. Maybe these little boys can lead the way. Thank you, Sharon. I am moving to a, a different tact and my word for 2021 has been kind. It's the litmus test for my words and actions. Is it kind? I love the children's choir this morning. Ron had put these words out on the top of a mountain the other day and all week long it had been circling in my brain. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. This year, we have lots of alone time. Even chairlift rides are just the two of us. Instead of visiting with a, a stranger sharing the chair, we have had quiet times, allowing more time for deep reflection. When Paul asked that I speak on the topic, here I am, I thought my best shot is to show up with kindness. That's the way I can let peace begin with me. Philippians 2.1 tells us, your life in Christ makes you strong and his love comforts you. You have fellowship with the spirit and you have kindness and compassion for one another. We have been given the gifts of kindness and compassion by our heavenly father. Certainly, this is the time to draw on those gifts. Do we really live the worth of all persons? Are we willing to show up when others are marginalized, treated cruelly, or without equality? We are called to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. For me, it's as simple as showing up. I can love my neighbor by showing up. Like Samuel, we must hear and respond to, respond to God's voice. Often that response is a simple card, a pot of soup, or a reply to a request of, sure, I can come help. This year, our neighbors are in drive through food pantry lines. You need, no go, you need go no further than 87th and Antioch every Tuesday 
to see the cars lined up for hours. Our neighbors are unemployed through no fault of their own and struggling to feed their families. Can we show up to load food into the trunks of those cars? Can we help Robin stop the food shelves of Center of Hope? Other neighbors are at home in their beds fighting COVID with absolutely no energy. Can we deliver groceries or a meal to their front stoop? Other neighbors have lost a precious loved one. Just within our own church family, that beautiful prayer by Paul this morning. We've lost Avis, Norman, John Trinkle, John Schneider, Janice Hedrick. Can we mark the day on our calendars and call those families each year to share the stories and memories of that beloved person? Many of our neighbors live alone, work at home, and are lonely. Can we make a phone call? Sometimes I overthink my response when I hear the call. Maybe they won't like my soup. Maybe they have food allergies. Oh, maybe I shouldn't invite them over. The house is such a mess. It's rainy. Working at the food pantry would be cold to be outside all day. Oh, I know Sally's alone, but I really don't know her. What would I say if I called? We can conjure up a million excuses. But like Samuel, we will only draw closer to God if we respond to God's call. The challenge is to just show up. We can share our gifts of kindness and compassion by simply taking the time to notice if our neighbor is struggling and diving deep to see how we can help. To echo Paul's quote of Martin Luther King, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Love requires an action step. We must show up with kindness. Our neighbor might have a different color of skin, different political opinions, different religious beliefs, but we can still show up. The church's vision of a community of tolerance, reconciliation, unity in diversity and love resonates deep in my soul. Again, I pray my response is to show up with kindness. I might have a different opinion, but I pray my thoughts and words are kind and respect the other person's viewpoint. We joined a um, neighborhood group and one of the neighbors challenged us with this acronym for THINK. T stands for, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it important? N, is it neighborly? K, is it kind? If we would each use that test before we say or do anything, I truly think the world could be a better place. Years ago, many of us wore bracelets with the initials WWJD. When making choices, the bracelets encouraged us to ask, what would Jesus do? In 2021, I choose to tune out all the noise of the world and tune in to God's call, then to show up with kindness. Thanks, Karen. Barry? Thank you, Sharon and Karen. Two themes challenge us this morning. One addresses racial justice and the other our response to God when God calls us to some action. God calls us to treat all persons as loved by God. 
Sometimes we find that hard to do. And yet Jesus Christ says it clearly, to love our neighbors as ourselves. May I share with you a personal lesson from 20 or so years ago, a reminder of how God may call us to see and to help the stranger in need. As a United States magistrate judge for over 30 years, I often worked a criminal docket, usually on Thursdays of most weeks. A criminal docket can be very routine. Leading defendants and attorneys through a litany and medley of procedures. And most defendants do plead guilty to one or more offenses with which they are charged. And after serving sentences, they return to society, either to home or elsewhere, wherever that may be. Unfortunately, many do not make it. They commit another offense and return to prison. In reviewing one of our dockets, one case captured my attention more than the others. It was set for sentencing upon a black defendant's plea of guilty to unlawful possession and use of marijuana. A relatively small amount was involved. There was no uh, contention that the defendant was engaged in drug trafficking, only in personal drug use. His maximum sentence of imprisonment would be only one year. As a matter of public policy, the United States Department of Justice at that time insisted that every conviction for a narcotics violation, regardless of the circumstances, include a sentence of imprisonment. No exceptions. As a judge, I was not bound to grant the government's request in that regard, but I would always consider it before deciding what the sentence should be. My staff and I proceeded into the courtroom the docket was called. We addressed each case in order. We finally came to the end of the docket and sentencing upon the uh, marijuana conviction. Consistent with its policy, the U.S. attorney requested imprisonment. The defense counsel asked uh, that any sentence of imprisonment be suspended and that the defendant instead be granted probation for one year. His attorney then turned to the face of the gallery. He motioned to a young black woman with uh, two uh, small boys to stand, which they did. They were the defendant's wife and sons. The boys were perhaps four to seven years of age. Uh, the three of them were poorly dressed, but uh, clean. Proceeding with the hearing, I pronounced the sentence of probation for one year and conditions that uh, and conditions that the defendant must refrain from any use or possession of the drugs and that he be uh, required to uh, retain, obtain and retain employment. The court's probation staff would assist him. Hopefully there would be no need for a return of that case before the end of one year. For many defendants, however, such a hope simply never materializes. But one year later, I had occasion to think about what I had done. The judge's elevator in the courthouse was out of order. So on this instance, I used instead the public elevator. And as I entered, one other person was in it, a young black man. He looked at me rather uh, intently and then smiled and asked, aren't you Judge Rushfeld? And I said, yes. And he then commented, you probably don't remember me. I was in front of you about a year ago. And I replied that I thought we might have met, but I could not remember any of the details or circumstances. He then smiled and recounted the criminal sentencing a year earlier. 
and I then remembered. He told me his probation officer had helped him get his job back. He was free from drug use. He had no other violations of the law. He and his family were back together. He and his wife and two young sons. And he was now on his way to a final meeting with his probation officer. This was the last day of his year long probation. And he added, thank you for having given me a chance for having given me a sentence of probation and not time or imprisonment. Neither his face nor black color had created a problem. We shook hands. I applauded him for what he had done, both for himself and his family and for the world. And we parted, not simply as defendant and judge, but as good friends for the moment, as friends and fellow creatures of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I was glad that the judge's elevator had been out of order that day. From time to time, I have thought about perhaps unlikely out of the ordinary judicial adventure with one, a young black man, two with a marijuana habit, but not yet uh, hooked on drugs, three for a caring wife and two young sons, four for competent attorneys, that is both the prosecutor and defense counsel, five for dedicated and conscientious probation staff, and six for an employer who was willing to help. As far as I know, I never saw this man or his family again, but I am grateful to God who blessed each one of us in a venture to save, seek rehabilitation for a man otherwise headed for a drug habit throughout our lives in all kinds of ways god blesses us and god blesses us to bless others taking our thankfulness as a, a bit further i am grateful the bible story of god's blessing a boy samuel and eli the priest to hear a call to serve the people. I believe it is the same call, God, who calls you and me, each one of us, perhaps every day of our lives to respond, here am I, Lord, to be a blessing to others. May God help us both individually and together to fulfill those calls to serve us. Thank you, Sharon and Karen and Jerry for uh, your witness this morning that has uh, strengthened us and give us given us cause to think.